Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all of you very much indeed for choosing to spend the next hour of the conference uh, with us uh, this afternoon. And we're going to go straight in to the films that our panellists have prepared for you. There is a man who's dedicated his life to seeking out the most compelling drama from around the world. He's not an easy man to please. So when he finds it, you can be sure it's the best. Dramas that are thrilling, provocative, funny, and explosive. His name is Walter. Trust him. We do. Entire box sets, completely free, available on demand. Walter presents the best in world drama. People don't like the fact that girls and boxing, they think it's a male-dominated sport, but it's not. Here in Gabon, between 30 to 36,000 forest elephants uh, have been uh, poached, killed uh, in the last 10 years. Is anybody there? I feel like I'm holding something I'm not meant to be holding. So cuddle therapy um, involves cuddling, as you would expect. It's about getting the benefits from touch. <laughs> Oh. Heard the phrase laughter is the best medicine. And laughter releases endorphins, which make you feel happy immediately. <laughs> now, the definition of a panel the panel discussion, it says here, was invented by someone who liked to sit three feet above his audience, talk with a group of his closest friends for an hour, and barely acknowledge that there are a hundred other people in the room usually sitting in uncomfortable chairs. So we plan to try to change that today, which is why I've asked for the lights to be up in, in the auditorium and for all of you to be as present as your panellists um, here this afternoon. If you have questions, I'd ask you to please put your hand up and I will ask you what your question is and we may or may not uh, take it on. In terms of the process, uh, I'll be chairing the session. We'll be inviting the panellists to speak on the subject which is how to win audiences and make money in free uh, video on demand. Of course, free video on demand spans right from Facebook through to YouTube to all four, of course, ITV Hub and I iPlayer um, as well, although, of course, not, not relevant in terms of um, making money. Our ambition is to try to make this an interesting session, an engaging session. It's delightful to see so many of you here. One way in which I try try, will try to engage is ask you to do quick polls, shows of hands, and sort of join in a little bit. So we're going to ask you all to show your hand if you'd like to have an interesting hour together. So we'll show our hands. That's terrific. And from time to time, I'll ask you to give opinions about things where there's no obvious right or wrong answer, and we'll see how we go along. Now, the Edinburgh Television Festival is Scotland's premier television event, if not the UK's, if not Europe's, if not the Western world. And as if to prove that, we have assembled before you this wonderful panel whom I will briefly introduce. Um, first, Selma. Selma Tarilich is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Little Dot Studios, which she started in 2013 and now employs some, what, 80? Just over 90. Over 90, 80 last week, 90 this week, uh, staff in London. Selma was the head of interactive media and licensing at all three media, and if it didn't sound so rude, I would call her a veteran uh, of, the, of the industry, and we look forward to hearing um, Selma's perspective. Um, Walter Yuzalino, to my left, whom you have just seen, is the eponymous um, head um, of Walter Presents, a partnership between Global Series Network and Channel 4, making the world's best foreign language drama available for free to UK viewers via all four, and occasionally Channel 4, and indeed more four. Uh, Deutschland 83, its launch show, was the highest rated foreign language drama in UK TV history. And Walter, we are especially happy to have you here on the panel, because as well as knowing all about that, you were previously a commissioning editor and a creative director at Betty Television. So, in short, you know a great deal about a great deal. Craig Maudsley as well, on the far left there, Joint Chief Strategy Officer for Abbott Mead Vickers. I'll be honest with you, we had an, all sorts of people wanting to be on this panel who know a hell of a lot about digital advertising, digital this, 
this, that, and the other. And we said, uh, much as we respected them, we would prefer to have someone of Craig's uh, standing to give us perspective, to be sober and sensible about the whole of media and also talk about ad-funded content and digital, and digital media per se. So, Craig, welcome. Done 13 years there at Abermead Vickers, absolutely covered with trophies and awards and what have you, and 10 years before that uh, with Saatchi and Saatchi. And finally, Sam Asante, standing in uh, for John, the MD of Unilad, who sadly had to go to a funeral. We've upgraded to Sam, the head of marketing for Unilad. Um, Sam's career started because he bet his sister he could grow a social media account to be over one million followers. In so doing, he met the Unilad founders, and he now, along with the chief exec and the MD, is key to driving the success of this very exciting company. So uh, let's show our appreciation for the panelists, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, we saw the showreels, and some of us, all of us, will know Unilad. And I wonder if I was alone in wondering what those originals were all about. Sam Asante, what are you up to? Okay, so I think original content for us is the natural step in things. Um, if you take someone like myself, who's grown up on social media, um, we're what we call the social first generation. So when I get up in the morning, I check Facebook to see what's going on in the world. I check Twitter. I even check Instagram. Um, we're consuming content on social media more and more and watching less TV. I don't watch any TV unless it's recommended to me by someone I know and trust. So for us to create original content seemed like the natural evolution and the next step in the process. Last year, we were the most viewed pu publisher on Facebook in the world and also the most engaged. And a lot of that was the created stuff. We get a lot of uh, qu quantity, but not so much quality. So we know, we understand our audience. We know what they want to engage with. So now we think we're in the right position to create content that they're gonna love and engage with as well. And also by doing, by creating short form content, which everyone's used to seeing from us, but we're also gonna extend it onto platforms like YouTube and who knows in the future, maybe Facebook Watch to create some more medium form content and long form stuff. Craig, from a strategic perspective on the media side, on the agency side, does it matter to you that Unilad, famous perhaps for curating content that they've found or been submitted to them, is moving into origination? Does that shape your perception of a, of a publisher like Unilad? Um, I think as long as a platform understands its audience really well, that's the thing that we're most interested in. I think you've got to be thinking always about not just the reach, but a sense of whether that audience is paying attention, really watching uh, the content that's there. And I think this has been the interesting shift for us as we've been putting um, commercial messages across such a breadth of different places. Sometimes you just wonder whether or not anybody's actually there for that content, uh, whether or not the advertising message that's alongside it is really going to be at all watched or at all viewed or, or, or of any interest <coughs> to anyone. And I think. If you've got engaged audiences, you know you're some way towards getting them engaged in a commercial message that might go alongside it or within it, so it is important. And you, so, to, in short, the fact that it's original doesn't make a great deal of difference. It's to do with the quality of the attention? It's to do with the connection that they create with the audience, I think. Um, if it's original, then great. That suggests that you know your audience well and you're going to be able to produce something which works really well for them, but it's, that, it's the nature of that attention that we're after. Okay, well, we'll come back to Sam and the originals and Unilad's journey and, I guess, what you're doing here at a TV festival yeah. and so on. Selma, from Little Dot's perspective, what is your relationship with original content? I guess for us, that was always an, an, an aspiration. So when we set up Little Dot, we said, uh, off we go, we're going to make some original content for YouTube. So for anyone in this room who attempted uh, to make content for YouTube, having come from, from telly, uh, there are various challenges. Um, including the economics of producing content. Um, the, the second thing, which, which was really interesting um, for us, that we bravely thought, only discovered once we set up the business, is that we had no idea how to get content seen. We didn't know anything about audience development. Actually, Facebook video didn't exist, so our, our focus was really um, on really YouTube. So we started and we learned on the back of two original channels that were funded by um, YouTube about... Um, uh, uh, f five years ago and it's a really interesting mindset you know you go from a very controlled environment which is a television and you your relationship is with commissioner that commissioner trusts you uh, because you're an expert in something to a world where you are 
a commissioner, talent manager, producer, broadcaster. You have to do your marketing and you have to wake up and see that your video had 14 views and everyone is slagging as you off. As many as 14? Yeah. Well, 11 would be me and uh, everyone else that I forced to, 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 to watch, right? Uh, yeah, so at least 90 now that Little Ducks are. Exactly. Now we, now we get 90, uh, 90 videos. And it's just that you, you, I guess your landscape... Um, of who you're competing and what you're cutting through is so massive. So, you know, you know in television terms, you control a destination. In the world of, of, of social, it's everyone from your bedroom producer to uh, a TV show that is, um, you know, putting, putting content on, on, on YouTube. So where do you fit? Where is your voice? And I think for us, it's been really, it's, it's a sort of organic, uh, uh, organic learning, learning process to land on, we understand this audience and we actually just want to, want to experiment with storytelling that will appeal to them. And we, we do that with original content, which we might find ourselves and we'll put it on, on, on channels, or we're going to try and, and pitch it um, to anyone who's interested in hearing from <laughs> A uh, company like Little Dot. Okay. And Walter, when you're not um, sitting in a smoke-filled room drinking... It's not my room, I know. <laughs> I'm wearing my socks. What do people think Walter's an actor playing himself? I don't have cats, I don't like cats. he's actually the real thing. Um, do you spend time with social video, watching uh, this sort of thing? Can I be honest? You not may, much. please be honest. Not much. I'm a, a complete old fogey, actually. I don't... Uh, I, I, I've had to learn... Uh, because of this experiment and this experience that we've had with Walter Presents and with Channel 4 and all four... Um, uh, in, in the build-up, uh, in the construction of the brand, we had to sort of start really understanding how to communicate with our viewers in terms of Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And that's the first time I kind of understood what okay. they were because I, 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 I didn't. Um, and, from, and from your perspective as a commissioning editor, a creative director, yeah. uh, uh, what, what, if anything, do you observe about the nature of the content that seems to do to do well? We saw some, some examples in the showreel. I just think... Overall, great content always will do well. My, my, my big question really is when, when, I, um, when I was commissioning at Channel 4, uh, which seems like a million years ago, but at that time, content that's commissioned specifically for online used to be like a glorified fact sheet. So in many ways, there were the supporting elements for embarrassing bodies as a sex education show, and, and gradually they became more interesting bodies of work in their own right, in that it was genuine origination. That was, but it was still a compendium to what was being shown on the main channel. And it seems to me in the past few years, since I've left Channel 4 and then I was created director at Betty where we made programmes for television, for sort of primetime telly. And now we to present that, that audiences are consuming in a completely different way. So it's the, the challenge for all of us, really, for me it's mildly easier because I got this existing relationship with the channel and with Linear, um, is how to communicate a message that the stuff is out there because mm. then viewers will consume it and enjoy a great piece of content, mm. I think. Well, of course, one constituency especially interested in ensuring that consumers watch the content are the advertisers who are famously funding content. We're going to go to a show of hands, ladies and gentlemen. Get ready. Anybody in the room involved in the business of ad-funded content? And producing it, buying it, persuading people to... Some. OK, some. Let's reflect on this very, very briefly then as we talk about ad-funded content. And Craig, are you, are you um, Abbott Mead Vickers, in, in, involved in, in this uh, fast-growing area of the media landscape? So I guess it depends how specifically you define it. So... Obviously, a lot of the work that we do, we would kind of call content, and okay. the work that we do is obviously entirely commercial in its ends. And we, we were chatting at the beginning about the work we did with Little Dot on Pepsi Max a little while ago, which was, um, you know, lived on YouTube. It was a YouTube channel, gathered a lot of views. We put money behind it to push it. It fit in that environment. It wasn't kind of an advert in that sense, and so I would kind of call that ad-funded content in a sense, even though its intent was entirely commercial, it entertained and engaged the people that watched it. So it's very much there. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you know, obviously we've done things like um, Christmas in a Day for Sainsbury's in 2013, which was, you know, feature-length documentary that we made on behalf of an advertiser. But, you know, I, I find the, the kind of ad-funded content piece as it exists within the, um, the broadcast environment just intensely frustrating the whole process of the damn thing and off, off coming here, which is fantastic. 
Um, Would you like to lobby them live? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it was interesting with something like Christmas in a Day because we, we had some early conversations with Channel 4 around it and we were sort of going, well, this is interesting. Doesn't this feel a lot like the new world? We could fund this fantastic documentary and it's got great talent attached to it and audiences would really like it. And then you get into the, oh, but we've had this conversation now and then, oh, no, you can't because it's not been properly... And it's just like, oh, Really? Whereas, you know, you can go to YouTube, you make it, you get it out there, it works. The audience doesn't care whether they've seen it on the TV or they've hunted it down for themselves on YouTube. And, you know, over time, you know, there's a lot more that you can do on that platform than you can do on broadcast TV. And I'm not sure that's a great, healthy, long-term situation for broadcast TV. And is this the principal way by which Unilad makes money, Sam? Yes. Um, so we create a lot of branded content. That's our, our main revenue stream. Um, and like um, he just mentioned, it's, it's about engaging and entertaining the audience. So that's one of the things we always push back on is um, sometimes it can be a bit too addy and it's a completely different way of thinking about creating the content. So we want to engage the audience in like the first three seconds and then what you'll find is you have a better retention rate and they're more likely to stay longer. And what we've got is, we believe is the social seal of approval because our audience trusts us that if we put something out there, it's going to be great content. So that's what we're, we're all about, making sure that they're happy with what we're putting out. Otherwise, it's not going to get the views, it's not going to get the engagement and we're going to lose our reputation. And Salma, um we had a, a chat a few, a, a few weeks ago in which I think you said something like, of course, a lot of producers are looking to increase revenues in a difficult market and many producers will turn to ad funded, think, oh, we might as well do that. But that it's rather more challenging. Well, I mean, I'll have to be honest. I, I, we had a line in the business plan was said we'll uh, do some branded content. I mean, that how. And that's how far we go. And I think we put some random number uh, uh, against it. And so we, we are in that business. Um, and then we got a first phone call. I think we were about four months old. And when you have to, you start up and you have to pay rent and, and hire, hire kids and maybe buy some equipment, you take all the calls because you have no idea where your business is going to come from. So someone asked us whether we can do this um, ad funded video on YouTube using two YouTubers. And we're like, yeah, no, of course we can do it. And I put the phone down and was like, oh, we don't even have equipment. I mean, we have nothing. But uh, so what started as sort of, oh, yeah, of course, we're going to be in this business. I think for us, it became really interesting challenge creatively and, and kind of from, from, from a messaging and, and a content perspective. It feels familiar. It is completely different. I mean, I, I don't come from advertising world. I didn't, I didn't understand that world. Um, I'm primarily content creator. But I think what might makes it a little bit easier and tougher at the same time is that actually this is now a completely different different discipline to, to what it used to be. There is a reason why TV production companies did not make TV ads uh, and, and, and vice versa. I think this is open for, uh, for everyone, but actually uh, the journey and understanding that you need to have around that world, because it's not just, hey, here's, here's an idea that we're going to produce, you have to be able to understand user journeys, platforms, how to engage with social talent. Uh, and, you know, it's still digital pennies. I mean, you know, I, I can't wait for a day when someone goes, oh, it's, we're not going to call it cheap because it is digital. But unfortunately, the same amount of funding is not going into, into digital content as it would go into um, TV ad. And for whatever reason, someone has decided that that's the way. Yeah, I mean, it's I kind of an add-on, that, right? That, so you I would never put it well, I, I, You decided that. I, I, I see it the, others, the other way around in a sense in that I'm on the strategy side, so I'm not involved in production and creative. And the thing that has always struck me about our industry is not so much how cheap the digital stuff, but how goddamned expensive it is to make traditional TV ads. You know, everyone's on different rates and, you know, that's, that's how things work. Um, you know, they, the... Uh, the cost of doing, you know, a minute in a in a ad break is just extraordinary versus how much you'd spend to get the same kind of quality for broadcast mm. or, or digital. Mm. So, I, th I think if anything, it's it's sort of going to meet somewhere in the middle. I would have thought rather than digital, yeah. getting those budgets. That are Craig, do you think this this has been a hell of a lot of enthusiasm about ad funded content in the yeah. last couple of years, and we've done some work with ad ad funded content on on all four. It's difficult, as Sam has described. Sam's making a great fortune from it. And Walter's um, uh, uh, good for him, not Hardly. affected <laughs> in his world. We'll come back to you, Walter, in a second. But do, do you, is it a sustainable thing? Is there going to be more and more money moving into content production? 
Or is it, is um, it one of those little innovation bits on the fringes that will come and go as the economy? I, I think the challenge is it's really hard to get right. And we had to, you know, again, early conversations with, with Little Dot when we were kind of getting into it because we had to introduce ourselves to a new set of production partners that knew how to make this stuff work. You know, totally different world than the, the kind of classic rolling off the production line of a 30-second TV ad. Everybody knows how that works. They know how to make them. They know how much it costs. They know roughly how it works. The effectiveness model is still really nascent when it comes to ad-funded programming. There's a load of stuff out there where you go, okay, here's a thing, and it happened to be funded by this brand, and so many people watched it. And then that's often the end of the effectiveness conversation. You go, okay, so did they get more customers? Did they get more uh, attention to their product? Did they get to charge more for the product in the future? Nobody knows. And nobody can point it back to that. And until you can get to a, a, a more mature and effective set of effectiveness metrics against it and are working out how to do it and that it genuinely has value because the, the tricky bit as you were saying earlier is that balance between you you can't be like really overtly right yeah. we're going to sell you this thing and it's going to be great and here's our product because you've got to engage the audience but equally if you just engage the audience and then the product or brand gets lost then what's the point of doing it in the first place because there's no benefit and it's, it's really hard to get that right Sam, so, do you worry about the sustainability i mean is it um, I'm not worried about sustainability and I don't think it's an either or thing. Um, a lot of the campaigns we've done that have been hugely successful have sat alongside like TV commercials um, mm. and sat alongside other campaigns and that's a, um, that's a really good approach and way of doing it, targeting different audiences in different ways on different platforms. And what we have is a content first approach. We want to get the messaging in there. We want to keep our advertisers happy. But um, you've just got to make sure. I think everyone in our generation and everyone's become a lot more aware of ad advertising and they don't, you know, you don't trust pushy adverts anymore. You can find out about a product um, online in reviews. Influencers will, you know, like give, give their opinion on stuff and shape how well a product does. So it's just about leaving a positive association with the yeah. brand as well okay. can also be really useful. And then running that bit of content as a wider campaign. Okay. So I'll just, I'm aware of the time. I've got a notebook full of themes and ideas. I'm going to move us on and I sort of pivot into something completely different around platforms. So, of course, one of the differences that we have on the panel here is Walter here, his business is played out on a completely different set of platforms and places to the, to the places that Sam and Sam's business is played out on. So I'm going to ask Walter, why didn't you just put it all on YouTube? Because I wouldn't be able to find it. Um, uh, in truth, it, it, the, the, what we've done has been a sort of really happy convergence between what Channel 4 was interested in and, and yourself, obviously, actually with all four, and, and my own personal passion. So the, the idea, uh, I fundamentally, but this is purely out of passion, so it was a bit of madness on Channel 4's part to actually back this, but it's paid off really nicely in that I love international drama and I love uh, even sort of the more commercial, slightly aggressive end of it, not particularly intellectual cousin, uh, because I just think that there's something really powerful about that. And I, and I genuinely believe that, um, that and I discussed it a million times with you, uh, I think that a certain type of ter national terrestrial mainstream uh, sensibility is now in crisis and is undergoing a very serious existential crisis. And I think that there is such a thing as a sort of international global uh, um, niche uh, mainstream that is emerging. And I, I had faith in my idea and in my project and, and a sort of... A, partly because of the drama I grew up with, but also partly because of the stuff that uh, Sky Arts and BBC4 and, and, and others were doing in the space. So I just thought it was time to try and broaden it a little bit. And, and it was really interesting when, before we set up with Channel 4, we're in discussions with Sky, with BT, with Talk Talk, with Virgin, and they were all really interested in trying to make this platform work. But where it worked for me, as a sort of old fogey commissioner, is that I loved and understood and knew very well uh, the set of criteria under which Channel 4 operated and how you reach an audience and how you grow it and corral it in certain directions. And for me, it was interesting to discuss this with Jay and with David and with yourself and, and to realise that actually there was something very powerful about um, using terrestrial as a point of convergence for, for material that would not necessarily be consumed by enormous audiences on prime time at nine o'clock or they would be too risky to play on a main terrestrial. And so sort of utilising almost linear as a really interesting uh, poster campaign for consumption that happens elsewhere. And to me, that sounded like the perfect thing because it sort of married the trajectory that Channel 4 was having in doing that. But also, it created a very specific club for people that want to watch the content. Okay. So you're... 
the, the, what the relationship... So YouTube, so, 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 sorry, I didn't yeah. answer your question, didn't I? Uh, so why didn't you put it on YouTube? Well, first of all, because, uh, because I fundamentally believe in the power of the Channel 4 brand. And I thought that the brand that we're creating was very aligned to the Channel 4 brand. And, and Channel 4 is a commercial brand. You have to get the commercials and, and the adverts and all that kind of stuff. But it felt like a really powerful portal to get viewers to access our content. And, uh, and now in America, it's different because we are SVOD and we're on all sorts of different platforms and with Amazon. So it's a different contractual relationship with your viewer who pays $6.99 a month to watch your content. And it's extraordinarily interesting for me. But, but the world I understood and loved was the world where a brand leads you somewhere and takes you somewhere where you don't think you may want to go. But actually, because you trust the full brand, the full brand will sort of introduce you to another sub-brand which may or may not please you. And so that was quite powerful. You have, obviously, an intimate relationship with the platforms on which you do your business. And Sam, and Sam, your relationships with the platforms on which you primarily do your business, which mm -hmm. I understand to be Facebook and YouTube, respectively, yep. uh, is how is that relationship, Sam? Um, I think it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship in terms of we put out a lot of content, um, but they definitely have more power there. Like, that's, that's the reality of the situation. <laughs> so there's, there's no denying that. Um, we, we just think we've got a um, highly engaged audience that really um, understa we understand the platform, the dynamics of the platform, what works on Facebook, how, that, how that's going to be different on YouTube, how that's even different on Snapchat and Instagram. And then we understand the audience and we've got insights that no one else has. And that's what I think makes us well positioned to create content, be it the shorter form or even like curate stuff that, you know, you see a, a dog pulling a, a shopping cart. And with all this stuff, it's such fine margins that we can put a bit of content out there and it might not work. And that's just because of the caption. And then you change the caption, maybe add a few emojis and it's just going to fly. <laughs> and that's... And <laughs> And, that, and that's, the world that's, all it that, takes. that's the world we're living in. Yeah, so. I mean, emojis are a solution for everything, basically. That's your main takeaway uh, from, uh, from this session. Maybe a dog nose, is that right? <laughs> um, I mean, for us, I, I'm actually so old school. So when we started, uh, there was no such thing as Facebook video. Snapchat wasn't born. Uh, we're not talking about Instagram. So actually, the life was much simpler. There was only, only YouTube. I mean, for us, there was an excitement about... Um, I guess this kind of tailwind behind behind YouTube. It's not that all of a sudden short com short form content or storytelling became the thing that we never really thought about in in, in tele terms. It's just that mobile phones were driving that that kind of consumption. But equally, there was an interesting um, you know, new type of creators were, were coming through, which which is really was our, was our interest. But at the same time, there was a perfect moment because I think for the first time you had uh, uh, an engaged audience who were behaving in a completely different way, which we, which we haven't, haven't seen. Actually, telly did really well as compared to music. So they transitioned from appointment to view to on demand, kind of windowing. Close. So it was, it was pretty smooth. But then for the first time, we have a generation who are growing up... Um, and consuming, curating content in a, in, in, in a completely different way. So I think for, the, for, for us, that was, that was uh, uh, what interested us the most. And then you arrive in the world of YouTube and like, okay, great, so 400 hours of video going up every single minute of the day, and who am I? I can't make you know, videos sitting in a, in a bedroom going, hey, hi guys, today my hair is like, I've done this, and you know, get a million views. Like, what, you know, what, what is your voice, and how do you engage with talent? And, do do you, know. you think that um, it's, it's possible to build, maintain, and sustain a profitable business only on social platforms? Or are there, is it about an escape route? I think the business, I mean, this is a question. We talk about content a lot. We talk about social platforms. We don't really talk about business, right? So we, we aspect of it. I mean, we've never been making more content. I mean, what is the spend by Netflix? Eight, um, eight billion dollars committed for next year. Uh, you know, Vice is spending, I don't know how much money there is in kind of Mickey Mouse Bank, quite a lot probably. So we're just making, 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 right? So, we, we, so in order to sort of establish our positions, but there will come a day where we'll have to say, well, who's going to be paying for this? Because someone has to pay for it, right? And I think it's either going to be a viewer. Uh, so let's look at subscription models. I mean, SVOD is everyone's obsession, especially in the US. How many 599s can we sustain? Mm -hmm. uh, or an advertiser is going, is going to pay for it, but you know, how, 
you know, TV model is definitely not dead. You still need to make your, your, your TV ads, but actually that's not enough. So you have to learn how, what your commitment to digital is. So uh, can you make a sustainable? You can, but you have to be a little bit like little dot uh, and do quite a lot of different things um, okay. uh, at the same time. And I'm going to ask a few more rapid fire questions, but I'd like to encourage any of you to think of the questions you need to ask because I'm getting you out of here in 10 minutes so you can go to the other sessions that start at quarter two. Craig, do you recognise the difference between premium and non-premium content? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I would recognise them in the sense that they deliver a premium return for the brands I'm helping or a non-premium return for them. But okay. I think in terms of what goes out there, I, th I think there's an interesting thing emerging, which is, uh, which I think Walter alluded to earlier, which is the relationship between you and the brand of the either interface or channel that you're dealing with. And I think we've we've now moved from a world where there was kind of online video and there was social to a world where it, it's quite emphatically Facebook, YouTube. And those two things are not just sort of ways of accessing what your friends are doing or ways of watching video. They're brands in their own right that have relationships with the people that are engaging with them and yeah. then sub-relationships within them yeah. with the people that you're following or the channels that you subscribe to or the videos you choose to watch. And I think, I think that's an interesting emerging moment where I think now you're starting to see in the past it was kind of Channel 4 had this thing and they were broadcast brands. Now you kind of go, okay, so you're thinking about, do I do a partnership with Channel 4, do something interesting with them, do I do something interesting with YouTube, do I do something with Facebook, what might I get for my client on the back of that, what kind of flexibility do I get in what yeah. I produce and what's the likely effect. Let's do a quick poll about Facebook and YouTube, because as Selma said, Facebook went even in video a few years ago. Can we have a show of hands with people who think Facebook will ultimately beat YouTube in video? Whoa. <laughs> okay, does that imply therefore a show of hands for those people who think YouTube will ultimately beat Facebook in video? YouTube favourite. Interesting. Panellists, anyone care to disagree? I think they're, they're two different products at this moment yeah. of time. I know that Facebook's launching the, the watch platform to compete with um, YouTube, but it's too early to say. I think I was just reading about it the other week, and I think what Facebook are going to do when they launch it is they're, they're really trying to like build that sense of community. So, for instance, they're going to re recommend programmes that your friends have watched and long-form stuff and and create groups around specific programs and shows so you can get more feedback and more engagement in, and interaction. So um, the, the real-time feedback is a really powerful thing that these platforms have. I, I think that you can like generate and create a business just from the social platforms because the way of thinking of our generation is you go on a social platform and you find everything, you find the news. So there's like great, great companies in the US doing this, like Group 9 Media have now this, uh, ATTN, and that's like my primary, well, I'm, not me, but there's a, that's a primary source of news for a whole load of people, as well as the entertainment stuff, as well as the viral stuff that maybe older people see as slightly silly. Um, as well as original documentaries, long form and short form. So I think there, yeah. everything's there. So without, you know, throwing shots at anyone, I just think you're going to go on a social platform and see everything there rather than go on an own and operated where you've just got something from one channel or broadcaster. Yeah, it's a challenge, no doubt about it. Has anybody got a question you'd like to ask any of the panel or all of the panel or indeed me? <laughs> so the man who thought that Facebook would ultimately beat you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Um, about the, oh, I beg, uh, sorry. sorry, microphone, please. Yeah, about branded content specifically, when when you, how does it work generally? Do you, as a team, think, okay, we've got this really great idea. Let's find a brand that might be interested, like the, almost like the traditional production model. We're going to make up this product. We're going to see, see if we can pitch it to people. Or do you wait for brands to come to you and say, we have this interesting new uh, marketing campaign, and we'd like you to help us on it, and and so that's a lot more involved. Which way? So right now it's working in the latter way where brands approach us, they give us a brief and we respond to it and say um, how we can um, hit their objectives. But ideally we'd like to shift towards a more, we've got an awesome idea, um, how can we align it with a brand and their objectives and create content that way. Let's make that happen. I don't think, uh, I've, I've learned and the biggest lesson for me was that actually brands don't buy content, brands buy audiences. Uh, so true, Craig? Uh, sort of, sort of. I mean, I think it depends upon the way in which, how mature they are in terms yeah. of their thinking. And I think to, to, to the point before, I think it's taken a long while for the people in marketing departments to really understand what they're doing with this stuff and to be able to have the flexibility 
and agility to work with it and really engage with it. So in the absence of that, they buy audiences because it's an easier currency. Any more? Yes, sir. In the white, let's wait for the microphone and go for it. Um, can I just ask you guys to speak to uh, quality and craft a little bit? Because you spoke about the cost of commercial production. I used to work in advertising, commercial production, post-production, visual effects, animation. Those things are very expensive to do at a really high standard, yet viewers are getting more savvy with what they're expecting in terms of a quality bar. Now on social and on online platforms, you're seeing short bits of a lot of reality-based, news-based, relatively inexpensive to produce, where the, the, it hangs on the idea a lot more and being smart rather than a lot of people, a lot of experts crafting something. And mm. how is that huge amount of content shifting away from high quality craftsmanship? I, mean, I would say certainly from, from our point of view, it's all about thinking about what's the appropriate level of craft for the place the, the content is going to live. So if it is being watched, you know, very quickly in you know, two and a half seconds on a Facebook scroll on a smartphone, you, yeah, you need to craft it well, but you need to craft it well for that environment. If it's going to be, you know, a three and a half minute long Christmas TV ad that's going to go out in prime time, a bit like a premiere, then you want to craft the hell out of that and spend a million pounds on it. And I think it's, we're starting to get smarter at working out where things would go. But I, I think I would echo the thing we were saying before, which is I don't think we see it as if we were able to. I don't think we'd purely look at it and go, right, telly's expensive and digital's mm. cheap at all. I, I think there are structures in the industry that force us to do that a little bit, uh, which I, I'm not a fan of. But um, I, I think we're getting a much more mature understanding of where we need to make the craft appropriate. I mean, I love to challenge that because we may, you know, we get commissioned to digital content uh, that will involve world's first, uh, six months of R&D, uh, crew of 90, building bespoke, uh, uh, GoPro rigs, uh, doing really dangerous stuff. It's just that we, so um, I, just because it's digital, it doesn't mean that there is no craft or knowledge or, or expertise that goes into it. It's just that we have learned how to produce stuff efficient, efficiently. Uh, there is a new generation who actually do work in a different way. So it's a structural, structural thing. So. You know, for us, it was always about enabling new creators rather than saying, hey, here's the director, this is his vision, this is what he's going to do. And with that comes, okay, this is why it costs one million. I mean, it doesn't have to cost one million. It's basically my, my challenge. <laughs> I'll promise to get you out, so I'm going to take this question, but it has to be a question with a one-word answer. What's the question? Okay. Um, <laughs> the question is... Oh, microphone, please. Sorry. Um, given the success of, of Walter Presents, are there any other... Um, uh, kind of curated services uh, with a personality as strong as yours, Walter, for other genres. Because it seems that it, it seems that it is specific to, to drama. Why why aren't there others around food? I know Dan Snow's doing a history one, um, but why has it been so slow? Given that Britain's you know the, the home of presenters and, and personalities on television. Why has it been so slow In to line, develop Walter, those, others, uh, those other services? In a line, why are you so You are to answer that question. <laughs> I agree, there should be a lot more. There should be more of that sort of thing. I think we can all agree on that. Thank you very much for the question. It makes me want to ask, Walter, what do you think we should be talking about this time next year? The death of national mainstream and the, and the rise of the uh, super niche vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time.